Okay, it says I'm live, and I can't see you, but uh, if you're there, thanks for coming. We're going to do question and answer. Uh, people have given us advice to go longer or shorter. Uh, let's go for about 30 minutes. We've literally had hundreds of questions, so obviously we're not going to get through them all. But uh, I'm Howie Hawkins. I'm seeking the Green Party nomination for president. I have the Socialist Party USA nomination. And uh, since Bernie Sanders suspended his campaign, we've really had a big boost. We've probably raised about 25% of all the money we raised over a course of more than, well, um, nine months and a thousand new donors and the social media has just exploded. So uh, for those of you coming from the Sanders campaign, welcome and uh, thanks for getting on board. So. Uh, of all these questions, I have a few to get started with here. And the first one is, uh, what are the spe specific ways you can get involved now? Well, the thing to do is go to our website, howiehawkins.us, and uh, give us your name. There's a place where you sign up, and there's a volunteer tab where you can tell us uh, what the kinds of things you can do. And our campaign will get back in touch with you and try to plug you into our activities. And the thing I'd add to that is we're overwhelmed with all the people coming in and we're doing our best to keep up. But this kind of reminds me of uh, Sanders campaign in 2015. He was not prepared for you know all the response he got. And what his people did, his supporters did was organize themselves. So uh, you know, get in touch with us, but don't wait. You know, do what you can, do what you know how to do, and promote this campaign. So the main thing is go to the website, howiehawkins.us, and uh, get in touch with us. We send out regular bulletins about what the campaign's doing. Of course, we ask for money, but that's not all we do. I, I happen to get on some of these Democratic lists, and all I hear from them is about money and not what they're going to do for us. So this is a little different. Next question, is our campaign competitive? Uh, I believe we can have a major impact on the debate going forward through the November election. With uh, Biden now the presumptive Democratic nominee, there's nobody calling for Medicare for all, nobody for a full strength Green New Deal, nobody with a real program to provide student and medical debt relief, nobody for an economic bill of rights but our campaign. So uh, we may not be in the running or high in the polls, but we can get enough support that we make the whole political system deal with those demands like they did with Sanders. He never won the nomination, but he had he showed the support that it became part of the national discussion. And we need to keep moving these issues forward and make the system deal with them. And, you know, we have various benchmarks. I mean, one of the things we get out of a presidential campaign, it's not a winning the presidential office, but it's winning ballot lines. About 40 of the 50 states. Uh, the amount of votes that the presidential candidate gets or another statewide candidate with the help of the presidential coattails determines whether the Green Party has a ballot line for the next election cycle. And that's important because if we're going to build an independent left party in this country like the Green Party, we got to build it from the bottom up. We should be electing thousands of people as we go into the 2020s, the local office and state office and then Congress. And when we have a caucus of Greens in Congress, nobody's going to be able to ignore our presidential ticket. So that's what we've got to do. And it starts with getting these ballot lines and then getting enough votes. In most states, it's one, two or three percent. It, it varies. Some states you can't even do it with a presidential race like New York and New Jersey. Other states like Alabama is 20 percent of the vote. That's really hard to do. But most states, it's uh, something that's within our reach. So we started this. 2020 campaign with 21 uh, states where the Greens had a ballot line for this 2020 election. And we aim to get on all 51 ballots, all 50 states and the District of Columbia. But uh, we don't want to have our local candidates have to petition, uh, it, you know, much higher than you do when you have a ballot line going forward so they can focus on running their campaigns and winning a lot of them. So I think we're competitive in terms of the objectives we set out for ourselves. And who knows what can happen? We got a coronavirus health crisis and a coronavirus depression. 
Biden seems to be hiding in the closet and Trump has shown himself to be a total incompetent. So who knows what can happen? And the best we can do is do the best we can. So the next question, please explain ballot access. Will you be on the ballot in my state? We intend to be on the ballot in every state. And we were uh, out of our campaign helping to pay for petitioners in the states. But now with the coronavirus lockdown, uh, physical petitioning out on the streets is untenable. So we're in the process of approaching, I think we have 24 states now where we have ballot access. So that leaves 26 states. Um, we have DC, so 26 states are left, or maybe it's 27. And what we're doing is appealing to the leadership, the political leadership of the states, the governor, the secretary of state, and the leaders of the legislative chambers to give us relief, give us another way to get on a ballot, given that we can't go out there and do these petitions, which were monster. I mean, we really needed about a million and a half signatures to get on the remaining ballots. And that's about double the minimum requirement that these states require, but that's what you need to do to make sure you can withstand any challenges. So what we're saying in a lot of states is we've been on the ballot for several election cycles. You should just put us on in the interest of democracy. In other states uh, like New Jersey, they did electronic petitioning for the major party primaries. So the New Jersey party asked for that um, so they could do their petition electronically. Um, and then some states have filing fees. So like Minnesota, the Green Party asked for that. So one way or another, we're gonna get on those ballots. And we pulled together a team of uh, lawyers who are doing pro bono work and ballot uh, access activists. I mean, these are the top people in the country in, in this area. And so we're helping the states do that. And uh, we'll still need to raise money for that because if you file in court, there are always these fees that you need just to get into court. So we're not paying petitioners, we're paying for court fees now. So. We intend to be on every ballot in every state. So look for us on the ballot in November. <clears throat> Next question is, what ideas do you have to increase African-American home ownership? Yeah, it's a big issue. Black America lost half its wealth during the Obama years because in the aftermath of the Great Recession with the predatory lending and then predatory foreclosures, a lot of African-American homes were basically stolen from them. I mean, the guy who is now the Treasury Secretary, Wilbur Ross, owned a bunch of service mortgaging companies that was at the center of this robo-signing, which was computerized fraud to steal people's homes. And Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, through One West, not only were they major predatory lenders and foreclosers, they were doing some of that robo-signing too. So I think the first thing we knew, need to do going forward is to fight the uh, discrimination by the banking industry. There's still redlining going on. The Community Reinvestment Act is not being enforced. So we got to ensure that African Americans have uh, fair access to credit. <clears throat> and I think um, something that would help a lot is to have reparations. Now I support HR 40, the bill to set up a commission for reparations for African Americans, which will study the best way to do that. I mean, first of all, we need to hear from the African-American community as to what they think will be the best form of reparations. And the debate is usually how much of it should be individual reparations to African-American households who have about one-tenth the wealth of white households and a lot less than they had before the Great Recession. And uh, collective uh, reparations, like the original demand by James Foreman in 1969, uh, coming out of the Black Economic Development Conference, they had a Black manifesto. They wanted churches and synagogues to fund uh, black TV radio stations and newspapers and have a black research center so that uh, we weren't just pouring money into the existing economy with its institutional racism and capitalist exploitation, where if you gave everybody money, it would end up in rich folks' hands in the end anyway. So that's the kind of thing the commission needs to study. But I think with the individual reparations, which African-American families really need, they would have some resources with which, if they wanted, to invest in a home and uh, they'd have the resources to do that with less need to borrow for a mortgage. So I think those are a couple ways we can increase uh, African-American home ownership. 
And I think the other thing I would say, and this is a broad issue in our society, is just access to affordable housing. <coughs> Excuse me. We have over half a million people who are homeless tonight. We have a situation where half of America is paying more than the federal standard of affordable housing for rent. That's 30% of income. A quarter of America pays more than half their income for rent. So as part of our Eco-Socialist Green New Deal, we have a program to greatly expand public housing. It's the same idea that Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez put in with their Green New Deal public housing program, except ours is 20 times greater because that's what we need to do to meet the needs. So it's a $2.5 trillion program over 10 years to build 25 million units of public housing. And this will be available not just to poor people, so we increase segregation, but it'll be available to anybody like they do in Europe. You have professionals, you have working class people, you have poor people all living in the same developments. They're not segregated. But we would reserve 40% of those units because there's nearly 10 million low income people that do not have access to affordable housing today. So over 10 years, we want to solve that problem. And it needs to be a lot bigger than what Sanders and Ocasio-Cortez put forward. And uh, so the problem of African-American affordable housing is not just home ownership, it's also rental housing. And we intend to deal with that. So the next question is, can you explain what happens if we get 5% of the vote? Okay, 5% is an important threshold because that triggers public funding for the Green Party in 2024 in the general election. And this is a post-Watergate reform that the major parties used until 2008 when Obama decided not to use it because he could raise more money privately. Uh, McCain had to use it, but since then, neither of the two major parties have used it. The amount of money for the major parties if they qualify is over $100 million. But and you're called a major party if you get 25% of the vote or more. If we get between five and 25%, the amount of money we get would be uh, proration. So uh, it would be significant. It would be over $10 million. And that would be you know, really big for us in the 2024 campaign. And it would also be a psychological barrier. You know, We'd have been the first third party to get that money and actually use it. Perot got over it, but he didn't use it. John Anderson, 1980, got 6%, but he didn't continue to form a party. So we would be the first party to do that. And I think that would, you know, just raise our standing a little bit in the eyes of the public and the media, which would be an aid to that campaign in 2024. So that's what 5% of the vote does. And uh, the best we've ever done as the Green Party was Ralph Nader, 2000. He got 2.7% of the vote. So if we did that, it would be the best Green Party campaign yet. So that's a goal worth uh, you know, striving for. Next question, what is your plan for the rural working class? Well, our Eco-Socialist Green New Deal has a rural reconstruction program that's about transforming agriculture with subsidies to the farmers to organic regenerative agriculture. We need that for a lot of environmental reasons, including rebuilding soils that bring carbon out of the atmosphere and back into the biosphere where it's not heating the planet. And we wanna have a program of parity pricing for all agricultural commodities. Parity pricing just means that uh, the, the government subsidy for commodities goes up with the cost of production so that all farmers get an income above their cost of production. It would also include a supply management program so we don't flood the markets with some commodities and are short in others. Um, and this is the kind of thing that uh, farmers have been asking for and demanding since uh, the populist movement back in the late 1800s and continuing right to this day from the more progressive farm organizations. And we, when we say parity pricing for commodities, we're not just talking about the usual things, you know, soy, corn, soy, corn, and cotton, but also all the fruits and vegetables and dairy. We want to protect all the farmers. And the other thing we want to do is rebuild our manufacturing base in this country and link the farms to these factories because we need agricultural feedstocks to have clean products that are biodegradable. 
and uh, we can build factories in rural towns where they've left, you know, as they have from the bigger cities in the Rust Belt. And so that uh, the rural working class will have access to good living wage jobs um, where, you know, factory production is all over the country. And the Green New Deal we're talking about rebuilds our manufacturing. We don't hardly have a, a machine tool industry in this country. And you need machine tools to build the uh, factory equipment for intermediate goods and consumer goods. And we need to rebuild those factories so we're producing our uh, electrified rail systems, our solar and wind energy, our uh, heat pumps, the things we need to go to a, a clean energy economy and instead of importing them from Russia, I'm sorry, China and Germany. So that's, that's part of it. There are other things we need to do in rural America. We need to ensure that everybody has access to high-speed internet. And there's many areas of rural America where they're still on dial tone or uh, second rate um, internet connection. Um, we need to have public transportation in rural areas. So we need to extend all the public services so that rural America has good public services. And uh, so those are some of the elements of what we want to do to rebuild our rural areas, which is not just, you know, farmers, it's, it's small towns. And if you go through the small towns of this country, they're hurting. So we want to bring back, you know, diversify their economy. So they're not just road stops for people traveling through and services, but they're actually producing stuff with uh, manufacturing. And that should be linked to the agriculture of their region. <clears throat> so next question is, do you support the idea of expanding the United States Postal Service to include for basic financial services? Oh, boy, do I. I think, you know, people think back to the 60s when I got active and they got radicalized by, you know, for me, the failure of the two parties to deal with uh, civil rights in 1964 and then Johnson escalated in Vietnam. So we had an anti-war movement. Well, the other thing Johnson did in 1967 he, he shut down the postal banking service. That's where I had my first savings account. I used to get $5 and I get this little savings certificate. It paid interest. The postal service was easy to use. And when I had to, you know, cash that out and go to the banks, you know, the banks looked at me sideways. You know, they didn't really want business from a young teenager. So uh, the have postal banking would enable just about everybody who wanted to, to have basic financial services savings and checking, um, direct deposit, uh, uh, consumer loans, all that should be provided by the postal services. They are in most communities. They haven't shut down most of the uh, postal, uh, the post offices. So it's located like I'm here on the south side of Syracuse. The banks have all left, but we do have a post office left. And uh, a lot of people here, you know, they, they got to go to the payday loan predators, you know, to cash their paycheck or their social security check. And uh, that takes a big bite out of, uh, you know, the, what they are getting. And if you go to the postal service and you have, you know, the postal bank, uh, you just deposit your money and then take it out as you need it. So I think that's a great idea. Um, so I'm all for that. And that's a form of public banking. I'm in, in favor of other forms of public banking at the municipal, state and federal level. But I think that's the one we can quickly do. And the union that is in, you know, the main, what is it, the United, there are four unions in the Postal Service. I actually worked in the post office for a while. And uh, one of those unions in particular is pushing that as a way to increase the revenues for the Postal Service. Now, the Postal Service covers its costs. The reason it's in financial trouble is that Congress passed this idiotic, uh, provision that they have to pre-fund their health care and pension funds 75 years in advance. In other words, before a lot of people that will eventually work in the post office are even born. And that's why their you know balance sheet looks like they're in debt. Um, and they've had to actually forego the payments they were supposed to make. But the Postal Service is self-reliant. Um, although, and, and this is happening during the coronavirus crisis, uh, the, the volume of mail, which postage basically pays for things in the Postal Service, has gone down. So they're having a problem from that. And uh, one of the issues we really got to push is that 
the federal government help the Postal Service at this point because I've seen reports between June and September, sometime in there, Postal Service uh, will go bankrupt aside from this pre-funding thing. So um, federal government's got to step in and help that vital service uh, like it's helping other businesses. <clears throat> Next question, what is your plan for dealing with student loan debt? Well, what I want to do is have a uh, student loan debt program run by the federal government, uh, a student loan program run by the federal government that will uh, relieve current uh, students in debt or former students who owe a lot and also provide fair funding for those that don't go to public colleges, which I believe should be tuition free. Or if they do, they borrow money for other expenses like housing <clears throat> and supplies so they can get through college without having to work so much. Um, and the way I would like to see it structured is that uh, people pay 10% of their income above the poverty line uh, for 20 years. And then after 20 years, everything's forgiven. The federal government now has 92% of the student debt. It should take over the other 8% from private institutions and fold it into this program. And the reason I favor that progressive uh, repayment program, so if you have low income, you pay a small amount. If you're a Harvard graduate that goes to Goldman Sachs and starts out at $75,000 a year, and I heard this in 2016, you know, with Teamsters I worked for, they weren't wondering why should they uh, bail out that person who's going to make lots and lots of money uh, with their taxes. And so I think it should be uh, sensitive to uh, the incomes people have and the people that <clears throat> who will pay for that, you know, through their taxes. So that's the kind of program. And I think uh, that would be a good way to really provide big relief for the students now in debt and uh, a reasonable way for students who have to borrow uh, to pay back according to their ability to pay. And uh, so that's my student loan debt uh, repayment program. And I'm looking on here. Okay, another question. Explain regenerative agriculture. Okay, well, what we have now is a very industrialized and chemicalized agricultural system. And these farmers, uh, we have corporate agriculture where a lot more and more of our farmers are becoming tenant farmers. They work for absentee owners who are corporations. Part of that rural reconstruction program I was talking about would basically say the only people who can own farms are the people who work them. And we get rid of absentee ownership by corporations. Um, and so regenerative agriculture means we uh, phase out rapidly biocides, pesticides, herbicides, all these things that destroy the ecology of the farm and the soil and bring them back to life. And uh, now, one of the things the studies show that if we're going to go to 100% organic agriculture, we're going to need about a million more farmers. So another part of this rural reconstruction program should be to have a program that uh, provides land and uh, technical assistance to get new farmers onto the land. And I think a lot of these new farmers are gonna be the people who now pick our crops. I actually work <clears throat> with uh, the Worker Center of Central New York, and a lot of these immigrants from Mexico, Guatemala, and elsewhere in Central America were farmers before they came here. And their dream is to be farmers here. And in upstate New York, where I live, a lot of the uh, younger, you know, white kids that, uh, you know, they're, they're from farm families, but they want to go into other lines of work. So uh, these immigrants could be the people that are our future farmers. So I think that should be part of the program. But regenerative agriculture means we regenerate the ecology of our farmlands. Sometimes uh, it's called agroecology. And that will create more wildlife for, I mean, more habitat for wildlife. And I'm not just talking about the friendly furry creatures that we relate to as mammals, but insects. You've probably read the reports that insect populations are collapsing, which means ecosystems collapse, and then agriculture collapses. And this is a consequence of both biocides and also global warming. So part of regenerative agriculture is to regenerate those ecological systems uh, in which the farms produce our food. So the next question, can you define socialism and how it differs from social democracy? Sure. I think as social democracy evolved, well, originally social democracy and socialism were synonymous. 
before World War One. But as uh, you know, socialism, uh, social democracy evolved in Western Europe. It became what we called liberalism or New Deal liberalism. In other words, uh, you have a capitalist economy and you have progressive taxation of the billionaire class to uh, fund social programs, but the economy remains fundamentally capitalist. Socialism means a socialist economic democracy based on social ownership and democratic administration of the major means of production. And that's an important distinction because under social democracy or what we've called liberalism, uh, the billionaire class still has concentrated economic power. And that translates into concentrated political power. And I'm not just talking about buying politicians, you know, by funding their campaigns or paying for a lot of lobbyists. It also means they have uh, such control over the economy that they can basically veto government reforms because they won't finance the government. An example of that was Dennis Kucinich. He was elected as a young man. They called him the boy mayor of Cleveland. And he said his campaign was, I will not privatize the municipal utility, which the banks and the suburban investor-owned utility wanted to do in the city of Cleveland. And because Kucinich kept his promise and didn't move to privatize, the bank said, okay, buddy, we're going to cut off your line of credit. It was only $13 million. This is about 1978. But cities need a line of credit because property taxes, major source of revenue comes in quarters. And every week you got payroll and other expenses. And you need a line of credit to you know, meet your payroll and your expenses. And by cutting off that line of credit, um, that put the city into bankruptcy and discredited Kucinich and he lost the next election. That's how private economic power translates into political power. And the banks just did that on their own. Nobody elected them. This didn't come up in a referendum. It's just that private economic power. I'll give you another example. When Bill Clinton was elected in 1992, he had a very modest centrist kind of reform program. He wanted to have a middle-class tax cut, wanted to put a little money into uh, infrastructure and education. And he brought uh, Robert Rubin from Goldman Sachs to be the leader of his economic transition team. And Rubin told him, uh, the bond market, which is really about 10,000 people that trade on Wall Street, uh, wants austerity and a balanced budget, so you can't implement your reform program. And Clinton famously said, you mean to tell me I can implement my reform program and get reelected because of a bunch of effing bond traders? Yeah, that's the reality. And so that's why you know we really need to think about socialism as economic democracy and not just as liberal social programs that are funded by progressive taxation. That's not stable. The billionaire class will resist, and to the extent we get programs, they'll try to roll them back. And that's been what we've been seeing in, in Western Europe, where the social democratic parties have had power uh, <clears throat> in governments for a long time. And uh, you know we've seen since the New Deal Democrats met their demise in the 1970s in this country. So we've had a cutback of the New Deal and Great Society programs. How would you bring jobs back to the states lost from deals like NAFTA and favorite, what's it, PNRTR, and that related to China? And I forget what the initials stand for. Um, well, first of all, we need to redo our trade deals so uh, they benefit workers on both sides of the border. And the deals are transparent where you have trade disputes, they don't go to these secretive trade tribunals that only the corporations and the governments have access to and labor unions and the public does not. And even when they issue decisions, uh, the rationale for the decision is not even public. It's only the result. And, uh, you know, that's a very uh, corporate managed way to do trade and the corporations manage it in their interests. Um, the other thing we would do is reinvest in America. That's the Eco Socialist Green New Deal. Uh, we should rebuild our manufacturing sector. You know, during World War II, the federal government took over or built a quarter of the manufacturing capacity in the United States in order to turn industry on a dime and did arsenal and democracy, which armed the US, the UK, and Russia to defeat the Nazis. And we need to do nothing less to defeat climate change. And if we're going to get to 100% clean energy and zero to negative greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, 
which is what the climate scientists carbon budgets say rich countries like the United States should do if we're going to avoid the worst of climate change. Um, that's what we need to do. So our Eco-Socialist Green New Deal says we're going to build the new manufacturing base through the public sector. Just like during World War II, we had an Office of War Mobilization to coordinate this public sector to produce arms. We need an Office of Climate Mobilization to coordinate all the federal agencies and the public sector manufacturing that we're going to do. So we need, for example, in the steel industry, we need to replace coke ovens with electric arc furnaces. Now, the industry's moving that way, but they're not moving fast enough. They want to wear out their coke ovens before they uh, reinvest in electric arc furnaces. Or the cement industry, 5% of the world's carbon uh, footprint because uh, you throw calcium carbonate into the cement, heat it up. The calcium hardens the cement, but the carbon evaporates into the atmosphere and heats up the planet. So we need a new way to produce cement. There are ways to do it. We just need to replace the old factories with the new ones or take plastics, a huge environmental problem. Most of our plastics are non-biodegradable. They're produced with petrochemicals uh, and they're new synthetic compounds. There are no enzymes in nature to break them down. So what they do is break down physically into microparticles that then are absorbed by organisms and they create all kinds of health problems. Uh, there are carcinogens, there's mutagens, and there's uh, uh, endocrine disruptors. And this accumulates up the food chain and affects us. Um, so what we need are biodegradable plastics uh, made with agricultural feedstocks, carbohydrates instead of hydrocarbons, and uh, a new green chemistry so that uh, when plastic products are discarded in the environment, which we want to minimize with recycling, but when it happens, there'll be you know bacteria and other uh, creatures in nature that will break them down and recycle them into the biosphere safely. <coughs> so next question is, what is the one message that you want all of us to take away from this tonight? Well, I would say, if you're for Medicare for All, a full strength Green New Deal, student and medical debt relief, affordable housing, uh, an issue that I'm trying to make a top campaign issue. We need nuclear disarmament in this is because the nuclear arms race is out of control. And it's, you know, as you know, the bulletin of the atomic scientists have moved to doomsday clock closer to midnight than it's ever been. If you're for those kinds of things, you know, don't waste your vote by voting for Joe Biden, who opposes all those things. Vote for what you want and make sure that people know what you voted for. If you cast your vote for Biden and you're a Sanders socialist or a progressive of some kind, nobody knows that. You might as well be a Biden corporatist. You get lost in the sauce. Everybody knows what a green vote will mean. So let's not waste our votes. Let's vote for what we want and uh, send a message to the public, the media, and the politicians of what we're demanding. So. I've been going half an hour. That's 30 minutes. It went fast. And uh, we're going to see whether y'all think this was too long or too short or just right. But we'll be back, back on soon to answer more questions and have other uh, events on, you know, live stream and video. So I appreciate everybody who uh, listened tonight and uh, look forward to the next talk. Have a good evening.